Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this event uh, at New America, uh, where we're going to be focusing in, uh, in on the Wagner Group, um, uh, an organization uh, that is uh, in the news a lot. Um, and we are really going to delve down deeply. Um, the New America has published a uh, great series of reports uh, that really is quite innovative uh, and is getting us to think differently um, and creatively. Um, about what this group is, uh, what it means uh, for the United States uh, and its allies, and a whole variety of policy implications uh, to that. Um, I want to welcome everybody and thank you for your time. My name is Paul Stronsky. I'm a senior fellow um, uh, at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and I'm honored uh, to be uh, here today to help moderate this discussion. Um, I'd also like to um, uh, introduce uh, our uh, our speakers today. Um, uh, uh, first, we have Candace Rondeau, who uh, directs the Future Frontlines, a public intelligence service for next generation security and democratic resilience. She's a journalist and public policy analyst. She's a professor of practice and a fellow at the Malikian Center for Russian, Eurasian, and East European Studies and the Center for the Future uh, of War at Arizona State University. She's also director of uh, the Planetary Politics Initiative at New America. We have Ben Dalton, who's program manager uh, for uh, New America's Future Frontlines program. He worked as a reporter and a researcher with a focus on Eastern Europe and Russia. We have uh, Katerina Step uh, Stepanenko, um, who is a Russia analyst at the Institute for the Study of War. Katerina is a senior member of the team uh, that has produced the daily Russian offensive campaign assessments since February 2022. Those are very important uh, and useful assessments. Um, that I uh, use, uh, and she previously covered uh, Russia's preparation for the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Um, and we have Anna uh, Kruglova. Dr. Kruglova is a senior, uh, is a lecturer in terrorism studies at the University of Southward. Her research interests focus on terrorist propaganda, and she's particularly interested in exploring um, what role internet media and social media play in the recruitment process and radicalization. Um, now, at Future Frontlines, uh, Candace and Ben have just produced a series of five reports under the heading Uncovering the Wagner Group, which presents over five years of research on the Wagner Group's uh, operations, its connections um, uh, to the Russian state uh, and military, and its role in the information war and force um, uh, mobilization. Um, just a few, we have a link um, uh, uh, to that uh, report at the bottom. Uh, and we will be taking uh, questions uh, later on uh, uh, after our, our uh, formal discussion. Uh, and you can pose your questions through the Slido box, which again is on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, you can do that at any time uh, and we'll try to pick up your questions um, uh, 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 a bit further on. Now we have a quick clip uh, to start this session um, and we'd like to play that. It focuses on a Wagner recruitment um, uh, ad uh, for Americans. You were a hero to your country, giving your best years in the army. You dreamed of defeating evil. You dreamed of doing much to make America great again. But in reality, you saw criminal others, the destruction of nations, the death of civilians, and all for the will of a bunch of families who thought they were earthly gods, deciding who would live under the row and who would be destroyed. You began to realize that this is the side of evil. This is not the America the Founding Fathers dreamed of. It has become the focus of the evil that is destroying the whole world. And today, the only country fighting this evil is Russia. If you're a true patriot of the very future great America, join the ranks of the warriors of Russia. Help defeat evil or it will be too late for everyone. Wow. 
Um, uh, I read about that that clip, uh, but I hadn't seen it before, uh, and it really is quite uh, quite remarkable um, and quite striking. Um, and so, um, you know, the first question uh, I'm going to pose uh, is to Candice. Um, uh, I'd like to get, you know, your assessment of, of actually what is the Wagner Group? We always hear about it. We think about them, you know, mercenaries in Africa, the Central African Republic, um, uh, in Ukraine. Um, but here they are, um, and you show in your report that they are not, they're primarily um, targeting uh, Russians, but not exclusively. Um, so what is this organization? Um, uh, you know, where are its all of its tentacles? Um, and why would it be actually um, uh, trying to recruit uh, somebody from the United States? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, it's such a good question. Uh, and that, that video is really super chilling. I've watched it too many times uh, and I had sort of debated whether we should show it, but I think it's important that people understand the connections between uh, the Wagner Group's kind of branding exercise and its recruitment and mobilization purpose in, in some ways. I think the best way to describe the Wagner Group is as a paramilitary cartel. On paper, there really is no such thing as the Wagner Group, a company, you know, a unitary company, as we would traditionally think of it, like Blackwater. It's just not a good comparison. Um, it is true that you know, private Russian citizens are engaged in the activities of this paramilitary cartel, and in particular that Yevgeny Prigozhin, uh, of course, who now is kind of the face of the Wagner Group, is technically a private citizen. Um, and he, as far as we know, doesn't take direct orders through the standard chain of command uh, from, uh, from the Kremlin. Um, that does not mean that the Wagner Group is not an irregular force or that um, irregular forces are not under the purview and overall control of the, of the Kremlin. Uh, I think there's plenty of evidence to show uh, the connections between the Kremlin, Yevgeny Prigozhin, and irregular forces that are now operating around the world, including in Ukraine, Libya, Syria, et cetera. Um, I think you know, it's been challenging for the US government in particular to describe the Wagner Group and kind of get their hands around the problem in large part because by design, um, the entire kind of branding exercise of the Wagner Group has been such that it is given a different, um, a different profile publicly, right? Um, so, but it does serve a couple of different mission sets, right? Most importantly, I think the thing that we have come to conclude is that it is really a giant deception operation. It is meant to misdirect the attention of those who would be scrutinizing Russia's dealings with um, different strongmen regimes around the world. Uh, in particular, it's you know the origin story starts with Syria, but extends to Libya. Um, it's very it's been a very important masking function for uh, the Russian military in terms of the deployment of men and resources uh, for military technical agreements in places like Syria, Libya, and so forth. And, but I think the other thing that, it, of course, there's an, an additional purpose, uh, which we have found through our work over the last five years, is um, the creation of the, the Wagner Group brand, the kind of elevation of the special forces kind of vibe um, that they give off, has allowed uh, the Kremlin to mobilize forces on a stealth basis, basically, for the last five years um, and move them around the world. Uh, increasingly, obviously, the biggest battlefield being Ukraine. Um, but we know that there's kind of this conveyor belt um, that runs from Russia out into the world uh, and back to the combat zones where Russia has material and strategic interests. Thank you very much. Um, ben, do you have anything else? I mean, I know a lot of you, a lot of what you've been working on has also been on sort of the social media aspect, the branding aspect. Uh, do you have anything else, you know, that you, you want to add? And, and particularly, how has this shifted? Um, you know, the Wagner Group, you, you've been watching this organization for the past um, five years. You have all this data from the past five years. Uh, but, you know, we've also seen a huge shift uh, just one year ago. Um, in uh, uh, February 24th, 2020. And, and so, you know, what is your sense of, of how things, how this organization has shifted and how their messaging has shifted? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, one thing to emphasize is just the sheer scale of the, the Wagner branded sort of social media space, um, starting on Contactia, which is commonly referred to as the Russian Facebook, but 
Also now a huge presence on Telegram, um, which is you know one of the fastest growing social media platforms in the world. Uh, I would say that so you know you started seeing these groups, these spaces pop up around 2018, um, and they were already growing at a pretty rapid clip uh, for for years. Um, but the full scale invasion a year ago acted as this sort of growth super supercharger, right? Like you, if you look at the chart of the membership growth of some of these big Wagner branded accounts, it just goes exponential um, as soon as the invasion uh, kicks off. Um, to the point where I would I would argue that these are now essentially mainstream media sources, right? These are where a lot of the narratives and even field reporting um, that ultimately sort of proliferates across the broader uh, sort of Russophone internet uh, get their origin. Um, we've seen uh, a rapid proliferation of, of, of localized groups that are clearly part of a centralized effort at recruitment and force mobilization. So in June uh, of last year, um, something like 25 individual localized uh, Wagner branded groups for regions all across Russia were created, all with the same branding, the same messaging, the same contact information. Uh, clearly a way to sort of draw people into the organization, just get get bodies onto the front lines in Ukraine to address Russia's really extreme manpower shortages. Um, some other sort of like broad macro trends that we've seen is uh, just in, over the course of the last year is, you know, users have been way more circumspect about their online presence. So they're, you know, deleting their profiles, they're locking their profiles. Um, some groups that we followed for a long time have taken steps to make it harder to, you know, see who is a member of them. Um, and we've seen them used for everything from propaganda to, as I said, force mobilization to um, crowdfunding. So, you know, using crowdfunded donations uh, to buy everything from medical equipment to weapons. So it really is, um, you know, although it's a uh, it's an entity in its own right, it really is, uh, uh, you know, serving uh, and helping, you know, not just with the sort of the the, the people power of this uh, of this war, but also with all of the other problems, you know, the the, the supply problems uh, and the like uh, that you're seeing, and you're seeing that play out in in social media, um, uh, and maybe either or either you Ben or or Candace can, you know, what is the um, where does Wagner fit in in the structure of the of the Russian regime? I mean, what is its relationship to the Kremlin? What is its relationship uh, to the security services? Um, and what is its relationship to other, you know, the, in your reports, you highlight its ties to other um, similar type organizations and nationalist organizations. So I'd like to get a sense, you know, where does this fit in sort of the, 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 the Kremlin orbit um, and in the broader orbit um, of uh, the Putin regime. Yeah, I think this really represents Paul a an evolution in the and maybe a step change in the Kremlin's positioning around um, what we would call in in Russian the Imperium, right? Uh, and this this the wide expanse that that covers sort of Russia's uh, geographical and territorial interests not just in its borders, but of course it's near abroad, which has been sort of a long historical kind of reference point for the Putin regime, uh, basically since he started as, as president now, uh, you know, 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago. Um, I think, you know, part of that enterprise has been without doubt, kind of glorification of World War II, the Great Patriotic War, and reviving uh, some of the entities that are really critical or were really critical during the Soviet times to force mobilization uh, again during World War II. So um, we reference DOSAF, which is kind of a funny little hangover from uh, the Soviet times, um, which, which was basically a body that was created uh, for the mobilization of forces uh, during World War II uh, in order to get ordinary citizens involved in the fight. Uh, and this was at a time, of course, you know, during World War II when um, you know, I mean, there's just a huge German onslaught, right? So there's there's kind of a drawing on that structure and a revival of that structure under Russian law and that provides for, you know, cadet academies, um, sports organizations, um, you, know, you know, training camps, um, typically targeted toward youth, 
right? Um, usually sort of in the high school age or you know, college age. Um, I, ideally, what, you're, what I think the idea behind the DOSAF mobilization piece is to create a citizen base um, that can be drawn on as active reserves. And what we see, uh, we see it very clearly in the social media data, but we see it in other sources as well, is that there's, there's almost like a kind of shadow overlap uh, between that structure and the Russian imperial movement, which has a training camp in St. Petersburg. Uh, it's called Partisan. They have a, a headquarters. Um, Rusic, which is a, another sort of offshoot contingent uh, that was born of the Partisan training camps, um, several different occasions. And we find, uh, you know, this is the same territory as used by Emercom and the Ministry of Defense more often than not. Um, and so, you know, we are making some uh, conclusions that essentially there's a, a, a bit of buy-in from, from the Kremlin through this overall enterprise of creating an active reserve. Um, but what we also see is, um, you know, clearly on the other side, just the financing piece, I think is the most important to understand, is that there's deep connections with the military industrial complex. And that um, a lot of people, it's hard for non-Russians, I think, and even some Russians, right, to understand that. The when we talk about the military industrial complex, it's not an abstract thing in Russia. Um, it actually is a very concrete set of parameters that includes uh, you know, a nationalized arms production uh, service uh, through Rostec primarily, uh, Almaz Ante, et cetera, et cetera, but mostly Rostec. Um, and that Rostec uh, through its export arm essentially is able to mobilize active re reserve forces um, to protect shipments of goods and services uh, that are parceled out under Rostec contracts with, let's say, Central African Republic or Syria, et cetera, et cetera. Um, likewise, similar arrangements obtained with Gazprom, which of course is uh, you know, one of the world's largest gas producers uh, and energy producers. And of course is an incre incredibly important bedrock institution, uh, again, fully nationalized and a state enterprise uh, that is, essentially, you know, critical for the sovereign wealth fund of Russia. Um, in fact, under Russian law, again, uh, not very well known, but um, oil and gas revenues, right, a, a very large portion of them um, end up in the sovereign wealth fund of Russia. Without that, Russia would not be able to pay its conventional forces. Uh, it would not be able to pay, uh, you know, pensions for its citizens. It wouldn't be able to do any kind of infrastructure work. And so in, in many ways, the Wagner Group um, services all of that and more importantly reflects um, the strategic importance of the oil and gas industry and the arms industry for Russia's economy um, and the centrality of that and protecting that for, for the Kremlin and for Vladimir Putin's very close friends uh, who've been around for a very long time. You can talk about those, I think probably uh, a little bit deeper. Uh, ben, anything to add? Um, you know, I know there's been a lot of, um, you know, the, the sort of evolution also of the social media kind of goes along with world events. I mean, we've seen sort of seen how they've tracked um, things in Syria, tracked, um, you know, this invasion. Uh, do you have anything else, you know, on, on, on um, how these events uh, of the past several years and particularly of the last year, um, you know, impact uh, their messaging? Yeah, I mean, so we've we've definitely seen how real world events act, you know, as growth accelerants, the invasion being the most um, noted example. But there have been these, you know, other key events in the history of the Wagner Group. Um, the Battle of Kashem, where Wagner forces directly engaged with, uh, you know, U.S. forces in Syria, uh, was a sort of early uh, explosion of growth in these these Wagner branded spaces. Um, and what we could see from these sort of interactions is that um, many of the people in these spaces were either seemingly directly involved as combatants um, or, um, you know, friends, family, uh, sort of first degree connections to people who are involved. Um, I would just, you know, reinforce what, what Candace said, which is, you know, these are networks more so than they are unitary organizations and they are embedded within what is commonly called in Russia, sort of an ultra nationalist social context. And what we're, we've seen over the last year is 
you know, this has been a longstanding trend within Russia for, for many, many years now. But over the last year, we've seen it kind of blossom into the mainstream and try to turn itself into a mass movement. Um, and I think what we've seen with Yevgeny Prigozhin, the sort of head of the Wagner Group, is an attempt through all of his sort of like strident public announcements, um, videos and so forth, to make himself a, a figurehead for this sort of emerging mass movement. It's sort of a, a populist outside track um, in addition to sort of the inside track that he he pursues. Um, but we can talk more about progression maybe in, in a little bit. Okay, um, uh, thanks. And now I'd like to um, uh, pivot to, to Katerina with some questions about, um, you know, uh, Prigozhin, um, you know, and the Wagner group uh, has certainly been part of this invasion. Uh, it has certainly been a key part of this invasion, particularly um, as the uh, the Russian military uh, struggled. So, could you please, you know, describe what you're seeing um, uh, and what you've seen in in watching this war um, and watching um, uh, the sort of the growing but also shifting um, uh, impact uh, of uh, of uh, Mr. Prigozhin and Wagner. Of course, thank you so much for, for this wonderful question. Um, we assess that uh, Lysysamp and Severodonetsk, uh, the Russian conventional forces uh, culmination after Severodonetsk and Lysysamp was the primary kind of rising ground for Wagner and Wagner's operations in Ukraine. Wagner has been operating on a small scale uh, during the beginning of the war. Uh, namely, like I believe the the element there were there were 300 elements or a thousand elements uh, uh, in the battle for Kiev, um, with the primary task of uh, trying to get to Zelensky and trying to destabilize the situation on the ground. As we all know, Russia failed at uh, reaching Kiev uh, in March April of 2022, and Wagner shifted their operations to. Uh, both training some of uh, Russian forces as well as participating in some operations in Denmark. Uh, namely, um, they participated in battle for Papasnes, uh, Severodonetsk, and Lysychan, uh, where they um, collaborated with conventional forces as well as with Chechen units and so on. When the battle culminated and when Russians see, eventually seized uh, the last two cities in Luhansk Oblast, uh, their forces, their conventional forces, were unable to continue the offensive operation, and that led Putin with essentially uh, a very interesting choice. He had um, he had to choose, um, likely on the recommendation of Russian Defense Ministry, to whether he's going to um, launch this mobilization in any capacity. And he had already seen that Russian uh, Defense Ministry wasn't uh, effective in achieving the um, goals that he had set for them, or he could conduct some sort of uh, crypto mobilization where he used a different conglomeration of irregular forces to continue his offensive operation. And this is where we saw the rise of uh, numerous irregular formations, um, given that he didn't want to risk um, his regime and also the implications that mobilization could have had on his regime. Uh, we saw the rise of um, the volunteer battalions. We saw the rise of Wagner. Uh, we saw uh, Barb units. We had uh, Rusi Legion, uh, Imperialist uh, Legion, and so on emerge. And it's likely that the Kremlin allowed them to uh, publicize their recruitment advertisements, not just to special forces or previous you know, veterans, but also to recruit regular uh, Vanyas on the street who didn't have experience um, and it, it was a one large force um, recruitment campaign. It looked like for Wagner, however, had special privileges. Uh, Wagner um, was offering a lot more money than um, other formations. Um, and it's likely that the Russian defense ministry even tried to compete with uh, Wagner and the recruitment efforts uh, because volunteer battalions also started to emerge um, around the summertime. And, but they were offering a lot less money compared to what Wagner was offering. Um, however, they did have state benefits um, on their side. And so as we saw these um, fourth generation efforts emerge, um, it is likely that Putin really anticipated that uh, the conglomeration of different irregular forces that were all um, subjected to different authorities and so on would lead him to um, this offensive group that would uh, renew assault um, and attacked Ukrainian positions in Donbass. That was not 
what exactly happened, uh, mainly because Ukrainians have launched a very successful uh, counteroffensive in Kharkiv Oblast, which had likely uh, shifted his uh, uh, perception into and his, him forced him to double down on Wagner Group. Um, I say this because um, uh, Ukrainians were able to conduct a sweeping counteroffensive in September, in early September, and then the Prigozhin started to emerge in a lot of places. Uh, Western intelligence had confirmed that Prigozhin had went to Putin and directly complained to him. We also had um, Chechen leader uh, Ramzan Kadyrov come down to Prigozhin's side and accuse Alexander Lapin, who was also commanding uh, central forces um, in Ukraine, alongside with Kadyrov and um, Prigozhin in Bishichan, uh, criticized him, essentially, and uh, which ultimately led to his removal and the appointment of Wagner-affiliated uh, Sergei Surovikin as the commander. All of these, um, all of these uh, changes likely led Prigozhin to believe that he could potentially gain some political power. Uh, we saw uh, both the rise of his um, new bloggers, military channels, correspondents. Um, so uh, think of Grey Zone and other wonderful channels that um, Candace and Ben had explored in their pieces. Um, we saw their rise, and then ultimately, Prigozhin made uh, the first public appearance, which was his recruitment of convicts. Uh, during this time, he, the Kremlin also likely gave him the privilege of recruiting uh, prisoners and, of course, using their training grounds. Um, but I think that all of this is leading to some sort of an end currently. The reason I say this is because we are observing that the Kremlin is increasingly pushing themselves away from Prigozhin, both rhetorically and on the ground. Um, the reason for this is likely that um, Wagner was unable to uh, generate uh, the successes around Bakhmut, forcing conventional uh, military to come in and um, reinforce their positions. Um, and now Prigozhin is essentially fighting for his life. The Russian MOD is cutting off his access to ammunition, um, which is likely they're giving him the fair share that all other units have gotten and not giving him the pro uh, preferential treatment that he had when he had favor with the Kremlin. Uh, but also we saw that his uh, conviction, uh, the recruitment of convicts had decreased um, and he ultimately stated that it ended. Um, all of these factors not only show that Wagner has not proven to be um, a combat, uh, effective combat force in Ukraine, um, needing always to have reinforcements both during Luhansk Oblast offensive as well as during the Bakhmut drive, but also it shows that Prigozhin might not have the same amount of favor anymore um, as he had imagined. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I think that was really helpful in, in highlighting, you know, while we focus on this specific group, it's it's one of many um, uh, and one of different entities that that is in this space. Many of them are connected somehow, um, and maybe we can go talk about some of those connections um, uh, uh, in a bit. Um, uh, but also we've sort of seen uh, how things uh, are shifting and shifting uh, currently um, uh, for, uh, for Mr. Prigozhin. I uh, just want to remind everybody in about 15 minutes, we'll start taking questions. So feel free to send any of those, any questions you might have through the Slido box, which is on the right hand of your screen. Um, and now I'd like to turn to, to um, Dr. Kruglova um, to, uh, to get a better sense of, um, you know, Wagner, you, you've done a lot of work on ISIS. You've done a lot of work on terrorism recruitment. You know, one of the things that uh, that is uh, that is interesting here, I think, um, is you know, what are the messaging um, and who is conveying these messages uh, to these you know mostly young men, um, but not exclusively, but um, uh, and men in their thirties actually. I think the report you know highlights. Um, but but you know what are the messaging? Um, how is this similar to other types of uh, extremist messaging? Um, uh, and um, you know what are the you know how does does you know Wagner? How does the Russian government um, uh, try to convince uh, these people uh, to mobilize um, and to uh, fight for Russia? We did see after the partial mobilization in September, we saw a huge outflux of young men who didn't want to fight for Russia. Um, so. Um, uh, what are the messages that you know these bloggers and these these recruitment videos uh, have, um, and or do you see them as successful? 
Thanks, Paul. Um, yes, as you mentioned, my background is jihadist terrorism and ISIS in particular. And when I was looking at the Wagner messaging and also at the messaging of such groups as um, Rosage or Russian Imperial Movement, I was surprised to see the similarities between the narratives and between the messages that are being sent out to the audiences. And it's the same idea of being a real man, being strong, being successful, going to participate in an adventure for a younger audience. And in particular, in particular, Rusic, I think, is very good in this because uh, they it's really visible how they adopt the tactics ISIS used to use when they would uh, attach GoPro cameras, for example, to um, uh, to the fighters and they would basically shoot the the battle scenes and then they would call people to take part in real action or they would produce uh, pieces of music. Uh, you could see the really high quality uh, videos which are uh, done in this kind of modern Instagram type uh, style. Uh, you could also see uh, the kind of typical narrative for the Russian audience, the narrative of patriotism, the uh, idea of protecting the country, motherland, which has always been strong uh, among the Russian audiences. And uh, if we talk about the Russian imperial movement, I think it's probably necessary to highlight the difference because they do seem to present themselves more as kind of intellectuals, if you will, in comparison to uh, the other two groups, which are purely focused on the kind of excitement of the battlefield. Whilst the Russian imperial movement, um, one thing that I've noticed, they do tend to produce a lot of educational material um, where they talk about historical facts and they are monarchists. So they do talk a lot about the heritage that the Russian empire has and the their big dream of making uh, Russia um royal again if you will uh and then also the reference to religion the russian imperial movement sees uh, the war as a uh, religious war and uh kind of disseminates the idea that if you go and fight in ukraine you are fighting not for the government because they present themselves as anti-government uh, but you fight for your faith for christ for orthodox church um I think one of the strongest narratives for Wagner as well is just pure uh, financial aspect. Um, the idea that if you want to be successful, if you want to get a lot of money, that's a way to go. And uh, another interesting trend, uh, I don't know if uh, Ben or Candice noticed this as well. I've noticed that specifically on Wagner accounts, uh, there are a lot of comments uh, which probably are genuine or probably are bots, but there are uh, a lot of comments from women sending messages of love, support, um, you know, kind of encouragement, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's also another very strong, powerful narrative for uh, for the group. Um, so these ideas, specifically Wagner, uh, are quite similar to the overall narratives that the Russian government is sending to the people trying to encourage them. And actually, uh, there are kind of, there is an ongoing joke among uh, the Russian communities online uh, where they uh, say that Russian propagandists don't see the irony behind their own message because the main idea that they are trying to disseminate is that, you know, you're so unsuccessful, you're so poor, you don't have, uh, you don't find uh, your place in your country so you can go to war where you can become rich you can become successful so it is that it's so bad to live in russia that the war is actually much better so essentially yes kind of finding your place um getting out of this uh terrible routine that you have uh there are a lot of um uh videos made by uh, russian propagandists where you see this very poor unsuccessful man who is either an army veteran, uh, say Chechen army, uh, Chechen war veteran or Afghan war uh, veteran, who never managed to fatigue since he came back. And now he has this opportunity to, again, make something significant and uh, contribute to uh, his own life, but also to the, the country's uh, future. So that's, I think, uh, the major things that are uh, we can observe on 
on social media? I just want to pick up on that, actually, if I if I could. Um, I mean, I just think so. First of all, I think those observations are brilliant, uh, and I and it's it's interesting to me, um, you know, how specialists who in this very niche area of kind of trying to understand this part of extremism, um, we kind of converge. I think in our experience. I mean, I spend also a lot of time looking at the Taliban and Al Qaeda and ISIS and in other contexts, and I saw a lot of those hallmarks, um, and I think. What's interesting is, you know, even in the very beginning when we were beginning the research now, you know, five years ago, I remember seeing these chats, you know, between Russian imperial movement, Wagner folks, um, about the recreation of, you know, new Byzantium, right, you know, this Christian Orthodox kind of Valhalla uh, that would then oppose itself to the ISIS caliphate. That was the beginning of the conversation. Right, and I think that's like really interesting. Is that that's kind of like the origin story for a lot of these folks um, to join up. But also, I think uh, to, you know, to your point, Anna, about um, the irony of trying to sell um, a better Russia, right, to a group of people who are clearly being cast as kind of marginalized economically, socially. Um, you're picking up on something very important. I remember also at the beginning of this research in, you know, 2018, um, some of the very early videos that were posted on Vacontactia were produced by a, a young man from uh, Toriati, uh, which is a town in Russia that is, I think, you know, I would call it like the Flint, Michigan of Russia in, in terms of like its rust belt, kind of rusted out uh, kind of nature. And, and what was interesting to me about this young man was that he clearly had kind of remade himself as a, as a vlogger and, you know, he somehow had used his, you know, his social media talents to enrich himself on some level, give himself more social status. Um, and he fit in very perfectly with a, a grand plan, clearly, uh, from the Kremlin to begin this mobilization process uh, many years back. Um, uh, thank you for that, and thank you, thank you actually both. You know, one of the, I've, I've spent a lot of my time looking at at the Wagner Group in uh, in Africa, where you're we're not really focusing as much on the ideology uh, of it when we're focusing on their sort of their activities there. But I think one of the very important things, both from the, this discussion, but also uh, from the reports uh, that have that are at the bottom uh, of the screen, um, are you know this. This group's ties to uh, to extremist organizations, ties to uh, the Russian um, uh, far right, um, and uh, and 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 all those the, the ilk. Um, another thing, I would like to jump back to Katerina for for a second. I mean, uh, we we spoke a little bit about how um, you know Wagner seems to be you know ha has you know wants to recruit from from veterans, wants to recruit from um, you know special forces, and and uh, you know which would make sense. Um, and there are ties to, to those, uh, but we've also seen Wagner recruit um, from from prisons, um, and um, that seems to have shifted. There was a very interesting article. Um, you know, these people, all, some of these guys want to get rich, but there are a couple of prisoners who haven't gotten paid uh, in an art article that came out today. Um, uh, so, um, what is the sort of role of sort of these prisoners, um, uh, and uh, how is that shifting? Because uh, it seems to be um, that is now closed off. Um, are all the prisoners that that wanted to go out, um, or um, uh, is this just another sign of, of shifting trends for for Prigozhin and Wagner in, uh, inside Russia? Yeah. So Wagner had used uh, their convicts uh, to largely stage these very massive assaults. Um, essentially, they they would use um, groups of. 10 to 15 in all different areas to try to attack in the vicinity of Bakhmut. Uh, we have seen this um, since July, and that has been a very costly endeavor for them. Uh, U.S. officials believe that Russian, uh, that Wagner forces have lost approximately 30,000 um, 30, of their forces, of the reported 50,000 that they've had. 40,000 of this 50,000 was uh, convicts just to give you the scale of the, the recruitment. Um, there are a couple of um, things that are underway with the Wagner recruitment of prisoners. The first thing is that um, the word spreads around. Prigozhin did not develop a very good reputation with these prisoners, uh, namely for the fact that 
um, as the word got out that uh, Wagner is actually suffering casualties, not many decided to continue with this uh, and not many wanted to continue um, and pursue this recruitment. The second aspect of this is that uh, we've also found evidence that the Russian Ministry of Defense tried to, to one-up Wagner starting in October, where they also launched their own recruitment of prisoners. Some prisoners reported that they received uh, favor more favorable conditions and more, more, were more interested in siding with the Russian Ministry of Defense uh, because they, were, um, they, they knew that Wagner had a pretty terrible reputation of the way that they treat um, these forces on the ground, essentially like cannon fodder for their ground infantry attacks with minimum uh, artillery cover. Um, uh, this is a very interesting dynamic because now Mr. Gorton is stating that he doesn't have this access to this privilege to recruiting convicts and prisoners. Um, the Russian MOD is trying to replicate the same thing. Now, did the approach that Russian MOD is taking to uh, these prisoner uh, recruits change? Not necessarily. We've seen a lot of uh, prisoner reports about how Russian MOD is doing exact same things that Wagner did, uh, killing deserters, um, friendly fire against convicts, uh, throwing them into battles with minimum training preparation. Um, so essentially, it's, uh, Wagner and Russian Ministry of Defense are kind of mirroring each other in a lot of their behavior, uh, likely because of their own preconceived notion against these convicts and, you know, and it is understandable. These convicts don't have much of discipline. They don't have much of, uh, you know, loyalty outside of having freedom. Um, and um, all of these factors really play into the compact effectiveness of, uh, of both sides of this uh, convict recruitment process. Yeah, I think that's 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 very clear. And you know, just some of the stories I've read of some of these convicts. I mean, they're 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 not some of them are not petty criminals, but they're they're pretty hardened um, uh, people who you might not want out on the street, and particularly uh, dealing with um, innocent civilian populations um, uh, in the line of fire in Ukraine. Um, I, I'm good, we're going to switch to uh, to questions in a in a few minutes, but maybe I'd just like to open up to uh, all of you. Um, um, I think this sort of leads to a question. We, we've seen some splits recently in, in, in between bloggers that are more tied to Prigozhin and bloggers that are more tied to um, uh, to the MOD. Um, uh, we've also, you know, seen this tension. Um, you know, Prigozhin has complained that he's not getting ammunition. Um, so, you know, what is the relationship um, uh, between um, Wagner between Prigozhin? Um, uh, and the MOD, what is the relationship uh, between them uh, and, and Shoigu? Um, and, you know, very often we, you know, see a lot of stuff about, you know, how close is uh, Mr. Prigozhin and this entity to, to Putin as well. So I'd like to get your thoughts about, um, about that. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Katerina, maybe you could uh, take that one first. Sure, of course. So, we mapped out at ISW, we mapped out what the Russian ultra-nationalist uh, um, space looks out, essentially. We have uh, pro-Kremlin mill bloggers who, you know, are either affiliated to some publications within the Kremlin or run around and report on the front lines. Um, they tend to um, amplify some of uh, Kremlin statements that have a, a semi-critical um, perspective towards um, the Russian Ministry of Defense. We also have the veteran group, which at the beginning of um, the kind of the criticism, the waves of criticism uh, over the summer were relatively equal. Um, and um, they, they essentially, they uh, their whole ground is that they want to have reforms in the Russian military. And they were really upset that the Russian uh, Ministry of Defense, when the war began, decided not to implement those crucial changes to uh, mobilization proceedings or, you know, announcing mobilization, um, trying to improve the, the uh, cohesion of forces, um, getting rid of the BCG system. Um, and then we have the Wagner group. At the beginning, around the summer, uh, when uh, all of these, uh, there was a lot of criticism towards the Russian Ministry of Defense. And these groups seemingly kind of put aside their differences and were interacting a lot more frequently with each other. 
there was a time where you could see a pro-Kremlin actor like Rabar um, interact with, um, with Gray Zone and Vargonzo, who is also a Kremlin uh, affiliate, also repost the same content. And um, that was a very unique time. And we, we had a hard time mapping it because we didn't understand where um, these kind of affiliations were. Um, however, when uh, Pegosin started to petition for legalization of Wagner, for removal of officials like St. Petersburg Governor Beglov, uh, for you know causing all of these scandals, attacking one of the veteran community's members, Igor Girkin, who's a war criminal, um, there was a lot of splits that were emerging. And uh, now the community doesn't look as uniform in their hate for the institution of the Russian Ministry of Defense, but instead they're conflicting with each other and trying to promote their own um, objectives um, and their own platform. And especially the veteran group is on the rise right now because the Russian Ministry of Defense essentially listened to them um, and is now instituting reforms that they've been so desperately calling for. And there's no reason for them to support a Wagner-affiliated channels at this point. So that is a quick breakdown of um, the information right now, and uh, we are going to continue to monitor um, these sections. Um, uh, great. Now I'm going to go quickly to Candice and then back to Anna, um, and then I'll start posing the questions from the audience. Again, you can put, put your question in uh, through the um, Slido box in the right hand of the screen. We also have a lot of questions in there, so I'm going to try to merge some of them together uh, so we can get as many in as possible. So uh, Candice and then Anna, please. Yeah, I'll be quick because I definitely want to hear some of these questions. I'm sure they're very interesting. Um, I'll just say a couple of things that uh, I, you know, touching on sort of uh, what Katarina was sort of highlighting in terms of the schisms that we see emerging. I do think one thing that maybe isn't right in front of us um, is that the, the big bank rollers of what we know as the Wagner Group. So that's, you know, Sergei Chemezov, who's the head of Rostec, uh, Gennady Timchenko, who's the head of Stroytransgaz, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the Kowalczyk brothers, right? Um, who are so closely connected to SOGAS, um, and of course, uh, some of the uh, Vakontaktia now has most of the Vakontaktia holdings. Um, I suspect that the cost of this war and the, um, the length of the engagement is something that they did not anticipate. Um, they're losing a lot of money. They're losing uh, a lot of clout. Uh, they're probably feeling a bit penned in by uh, not just the sanctions, but by the fact that they can't escape in the normal way that they normally could. Um, they, they are having difficulty consolidating their, uh, their funds, uh, which is, again, why I think we're seeing some shifts to the digital currency uh, and the calls for digital currency um, to be donated uh, from, you know, Wagner Group related mill bloggers and so forth. So I think what's really important to understand is that there are other bigger, much more wealthy oligarchs uh, behind Yevgeny Prigozhin. Uh, you know, Deripaska is another one who has uh, allegedly his own connections to PMC Reddit, which we've been hearing not that much about, but we know that it's it's out there. Um, there are, you know, it's really important to understand that every single one of these irregular forces has a cluster of other much more wealthy oligarchs. Who are closer to Putin's inner circle, the so-called Ozuro collective, uh, and that those relationships are historical, and, and they they have tended to survive it, uh, that that made Putin so powerful. Uh, and he is actually not; he's very much beholden to them uh, in ways that. Um, that are difficult to, to explain. But the other thing I want to just note here, uh, and then I think Anna probably has some really good comments to make, is that I think, I hope what people take away from this is that Russia is not a monolith um, and that we should not be thinking about Russia a, as a monolith when we're talking about um, the higher level of challenges, diplomatically speaking. Uh, you have internally inside Russia, just as you have in the United States, a lot of debate over you know, what this war in Ukraine means, um, and although I think, you know, largely we can see in Russia, there's a great deal of support 
uh, across the population, there's also a lot of dissent. Uh, and some of that dissent is from the far right, some of it is from the far left, some of it is centrist in its nature, um, but there is dissent in Russia. And I think it's important to keep that in mind that we're not dealing with just one unitary bloc when we're talking about Russia in, in diplomatic terms. Hannah, please. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I just wanted to start uh, on the follow-up with um, the point Candice made. Uh, yes, absolutely, Russia is not a monolith. And one of the things that uh, came up, well, relatively recently, I think, is the uh, kind of relatively new unit, which is called Freedom to Russia. And this is a uh, organization, a unit consisting of um, former Russian uh, fighters, whether it's uh, the Wagner Group or whether it's official Russian army, who decided to quit and join the Ukrainian forces, and they basically present themselves as this uh, liberal force force that is against the war, but also they are trying to fight for the kind of bright future of Russia, a liberal democratic future of Russia. And you can see a lot of uh, commentaries from, uh, in particular, Russian imperial movement, who just released a video, a long video, talking about their kind of um, uh, defectors and uh, how they abandoned the true values, uh, traditional values, and shifted to um, what they call gay Europa. Uh, so that's uh, one clear uh, argument to show that uh, the center of Russia does exist and. Uh, it also exists in the on the battlefield, but also in relation to I know Candace and Ben uh, did explore this question a lot in their report. Um, the connection between these three groups, Rosage, Wagner, and the Russian Imperial Movement, um, it's not always explicit on social media, but sometimes you do pick up uh, some cross references. And again, just um, in the last few weeks, the Rosage social media produced several publications. One of them was a picture where uh, I think it was the Wagner group and then posing uh, somewhere in Ukraine with a symbol of Rusich as well. Some of the groups uh, had the um, emblems of Rusich. And then they also uh, reposted a, uh, an interview uh, from a channel which is called this, The Ordinary Tsarism. And this is a kind of, again, monarchist channel where um, a representative of the Russian imperial movement who fights in Ukraine at the moment was asked about his attitude towards Rusage and how he sees it. And the idea he was trying to um, deliver is that, and it's quite interesting because even though they share the same approach as the Russian government does, it seems like they're very suspicious of the Russian government at the same time. And the point the, the guy made is that most likely, they are not going to be useful once the war is over. So they need to get united now and kind of make a contribution to their future once the war is finished. Uh, so they definitely do share some common interests and I guess also have uh, interactions uh, with each other um, on the battlefield or outside the battlefield and um, seem to support each other quite actively. Um, uh, Anna, that actually leads into one of the questions that we have, um, and it, it specifically focuses on on uh, con uh, convict recruitment. But I also think you could you could add, add this to sort of recruitment of people on the on the far right um, as well. And the question is, you know, are these people being recruited um, uh, to to sort of to possibly thin the ranks of you know military age men who? Uh, might pose a threat to the regime after uh, after the war, whether they are from the right, whether they're criminal elements, um, or is it simply do they just need more cannon fodder, um, uh, and that's what some of these recruitments um, are about? Is there is there any sort of broader purpose of of going after both convicts and the far right? Well, I think for the far right is the matter of ideology. They are not being recruited they kind of recruit themselves if you will they are happily going and volunteer and support the cause because they see ukraine as part of russian empire um and it's interesting well and it's kind of terrifying at the same time the russian imperial movement since the beginning of war um started to refer to ukraine which is ukraine in russian as Ukraina, 
which in one of the interpretations, the uh, the root of this word, according to one of the um, uh, interpretations, is the kind of side of the country. And you can see the message that the, 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 the group is trying to deliver that, again, they don't see Ukraine as independent democratic country. They see it as part of Russia and they are trying to do everything they can to bring it back. Um, with um, prisoners, I think first the Russian government just didn't want to um, make the general population angry and they the initial narratives, because the rumors about mobilization and the general recruitment uh, were going on uh, across Russia for a while. And the, the I think there was the fear that there will be a turmoil and people will rise up and uh, start protesting. So I think that was a way for the Russian government to kind of, you know, use the, the prisoners as, as fighters instead mm -hmm. of recruiting Great. their own population. Um, great. Now um, I'm going to merge a bunch of questions. We have a lot of questions actually about uh, Wagner in Africa. Um, you know, some of them, you know, where are they operating? I mean, I think it's the Central African Republic. You know, we've seen them in Libya. We probably see them in, in, in Mali. Perhaps they're set, stepping into Burkina Faso. We've seen them in Mozambique and Sudan. Um, uh, but what is the impact of this war? What is the impact of these, in, in, these new strains between, um, you know, the, the MOD and Prigozhin? What impact does that have on Wagner's ability to um, uh, to operate in Africa? Is it um, now going to focus more on Africa because of, of strains at home? Uh, and you know, what does it mean for for uh, Wagner's global uh, operations? I'll try and answer this, uh, and I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts too, Paul. But I I will say that there's a lot of temptation to predict, you know, what happens in Ukraine, you know, with the force mobilization there, and how will that you know, fit with uh, with Africa, but if we if we just keep in mind the simple premise that um, where Rostec goes, there goes Wagner. Okay, um, then we start to understand that as long as African nations want AK forty sevens, you know, Pansir anti batteries, um, you know, Kamaz infantry uh, trucks and and fighting vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. While there's a demand for that uh, in Africa and other parts of the world, Latin America, we know, of, for instance, Venezuela, uh, Nicaragua, Cuba, even uh, wherever Rostec has relations, we should expect that we will see uh, something that looks like uh, the Wagner Group today. Uh, and that will continue for a long time. But let's be very clear. Russia is the second largest um, purveyor of arms deals in the world after the United States. Um, I don't think we're going to see that change, possibly even in our lifetimes. Um, the question is, will the behavior change in terms of uh, the kind of the format of those deals? And what the Kremlin has gained from these military technical arrangements uh, and this engagement in Africa in particular is a lot of votes in the UN General Assembly uh, and a lot of votes on the UN Security Council that uh, have been hard fought and hard won. Uh, there's a lot of influence now uh, that Russia is able to wield as a permanent member of the UN, uh, UN Security Council over a pretty large block of what were, you know, at one point or another, either non-aligned states um, or states that had been previously into the Cold War years aligned with the Soviet Union. And it's, it's leveraged that influence very well by blocking, uh, you know, votes uh, as we see today. Uh, in, uh, on the Ukraine resolution that is, uh, that is pending. So I think it's really important to understand that um, Russia will continue to leverage that access in, in Africa in multiple different ways. Um, and, and Candace, I would agree with that. Um, the only thing I would uh, also add, I mean, I think, I think you're right to highlight, you know, Wagner is, is what we're focusing on now, uh, but there could be others that, that follow it. Um, also, you know, what we saw after, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, was that there was a lot of Russian soldiers, ex-soldiers who had a lot of uh, experience and they could market themselves even on their own um, uh, in places in Africa. Um, so I think this is certainly something we will see um, uh, continuing. Um, and then the last question, I'm gonna, I'm gonna merge two of them uh, together and I apologize. I think I got most of them either in the discussion uh, or in the first part, um, but it's, um, there was some discussion about how, how Wagner is not like a normal American PMC. So could somebody go into what the difference is of that? Um, and then, you know, 
since it's not a sort of since it's a regular fighting force, what implications does that have for its POWs? Um, how does Ukraine, you know, what are Ukraine's responsibilities for for treating them? Uh, what are the rules of 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 war? Because they're not really covered in like a normal POW in the Geneva Conventions. So, um, uh, Candace and anyone else. I'll try and answer this one really quickly. Um, here are the primary differences between an American PMC and what we know as the Wagner Group. Number one, uh, American PMCs typically are registered as corporations or S companies in the United States. So they have a tax base, they have a real face, et cetera. There is no such unitary entity that is registered in Russia. There is a Wagner Group Center that is now most recently uh, registered as a company, um, but that is only for the real estate holding in St. Petersburg. It is not for the entire enterprise. So to be very clear, not a corporation first and foremost. So therefore not a private entity. Secondly, um, most importantly, unlike US PMCs, which are private entities, corporations, um, the Wagner Group tends to pay its soldiers via shell companies, okay, that more often than not have illicit deals uh, that break embargoes of international law um, and that facilitate the illicit um, sanctions busting of the Ministry of Defense uh, and state enterprises. That's another big distinction. The second piece, the last piece I would just say is when we talk about um, state responsibility for combatants in these types of situations, whether it's in Africa or in Ukraine, although a little difference there for lots of different reasons. Um, what's important to understand is that it appears that the state has overall control of these forces, uh, unlike uh, let's say Blackwater or um, you know G4S, which is of course these famous uh, Western style um, PMCs. Um, you cannot say that the United States has effective control over those entities, right? What they do is what they do because they are private entities. In this instance, um, for the Wagner Group, everything that they do can be tied to state responsibility through the chain of command, um, even. Here's a very good example. Blackwater, okay, um, would source its own ammo, would source its own shells, would source its own protective equipment. You, we have a very clear examples, very public examples of Yevgeny Prigozhin saying the Ministry of Defense needs to provide us with ammo, okay? That is a very unusual arrangement. Uh, we would not expect the Pentagon to give ammo to Blackwater, right? Um, and so I think that's the brightest line I think I can say. As far as uh, Wagner and, com and combatants and, and the Geneva Conventions, um, you know, combatants on the field are basically, you know, subject to the Geneva Conventions no matter where they are. Um, lots of people will, you know, debate uni universal jurisdiction for war crimes. Um, I, I will not debate those. I think that it's, it's very clear. Uh, there's a long tradition. You can go back to the Nuremberg trials to understand kind of where this, uh, this tradition of international justice comes from. Um, as far as the POWs, uh, I mean, that's a question of national law for Russia. We don't really understand um, anything other than that there is an executive order that was issued by, by Putin that seems to uh, allow for some sort of amnesty uh, for prisoners who sign up with the Wagner Group and other uh, irregular forces. Beyond that, um, it's really up to the national law uh, and, the, and the national uh, bodies of, of Russia uh, to apply human rights law. But I think we can say quite clearly that there are questions to be asked about human rights violations. Um, and just one other difference that I, that I would add is that um, you know, the United States and many other Western um, um, countries have, have uh, at least signed on to us something called the Montreux document that in theory is supposed to um, uh, hold their PMCs accountable for any uh, war crimes or, or um, you know, uh, brutality um, uh, and Russia has not um, done that, so that's a that's another difference. Um, you know, finally, I want to thank everybody. I'm um, just everyone has any final thoughts about sort of the policy implications. I know we're a few minutes over, but um, you know, or or how do we hold you know these types of organizations accountable? And and any any final thoughts um, from uh, any one of you? Um, and maybe just uh, thirty seconds, um, uh, if possible, to 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 make it quick. Um, thirty uh, seconds. Candace, yeah, 30, 30 seconds to a minute. 30 seconds. 30 yeah. seconds, no question, international tribunal. Um, that is the only way to handle the Wagner Group now. Uh, the, you know, not just in the context of Ukraine, 
uh, but in the context of other locations where they operate. Um, there is, you know, whatever the impressions that uh, people may have in the field, particularly in Central African Republic, uh, you know, parts of Africa, um, maybe they are a stabilizing force, uh, you know, comparatively speaking, but it doesn't mean they're not violating international law. Um, and, it, and they should be treated, you know, under international law uh, appropriately. Unfortunately, um, the ICC has some limitations on what it can pursue, uh, especially in the context of Ukraine uh, when it comes to the crime of aggression. But I think what we, when we're talking about, you know, crime of aggression case when it comes to Russia and Ukraine, um, the Wagner Group and irregulars uh, in, you know, under Russian control are one of the prime examples, right, uh, that you can point to and say, this was a pattern in practice set of crimes and intention um, to use all necessary force, all necessary resources um, to violate the territory of, of Ukraine. Uh, and I think now the, the goal for the United States, for Ukraine, uh, for Europe, for all of the allies who are uh, behind uh, freedom and liberty for Ukraine is to really pursue justice and to do so aggressively. Um, and yeah, I just also want to highlight, I mean, while we focused on the atrocities in, in Ukraine, um, they have a long history of atrocities, this organization against civilians, even if they are bringing stability, um, we've seen their atrocities in, in Syria, um, Libya, Central African Republic, and Mali um, uh, already. Um, ben, Anna, uh, Katerina, any other uh, final thoughts, uh, recommendations? The observation that Pan has made was perfect. Uh, we're going to see more of these. Uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense is commissioning more of uh, private military and private security cooperation. And the US and the West did not stop at um, just Wagner. Uh, there's going to be more pushes. The Gozhin is not the only person who participates in this, it's the whole system. Great, thanks. Um, very quickly, one last thing to sort of keep an eye on, I think, is the very effective use by Wagner and sort of affiliated organizations to pump up narratives of sort of like faux anti-imperialism, especially across Africa, to sort of solicit support from, uh, you know, populations. Uh, I think, you know, this has proven to be a very rich narrative for them. And even though it, it does seem a bit sort of preposterous in some senses, because Russia itself is engaging in, in very active imperial expansion, even as we speak. Uh, it, it has a, quite a bit of purchase for you know, obvious historic, historical reasons in many of the places that it's seeking to operate and expand. Great. Just another 30 seconds um, to follow up on Ben's point. Um, I think also it's important, we, we talk a lot about misinformation, disinformation in the moment, right? And this is another factor that contributes to uh, the Wagner group success and other group success as well, where a lot of Russian population who do support the war or do go uh, and join these groups do so because they heard something about the atrocities that the Ukrainians are doing supposedly, as they think, in to, to Russians or the Nazi groups that, again, supposedly exist in Ukraine. And they do genuinely believe in this. And they don't do their due diligence and they don't check the facts. So I think targeting this this problem is another thing to to address. I think that's that's a great um uh, all great um things that we can focus on and and they're they're forward leaning and things that I think uh, are certainly manageable um uh, with small steps and hopefully eventually uh, big steps. So I'd like to thank uh, first of all I'd like to thank uh, Ben, uh, Anna, uh, Candice, Katerina and the entire team uh, at New America for um uh, for organizing this event. Uh, I want to thank you also um uh, for inviting me to participate. I want to thank our, our uh, audience for great, really great and incisive questions. I kind of merged a lot of them together, uh, but I think I got the, the gist of all. Um, and I just want to remind everybody uh, that you can, uh, there's the link to these reports. Um, it's down at the bottom of the screen. Um, and I really do urge you to read them. Um, uh, I've been focusing on a Wagner group for, for many, many years, and I learned a lot um, uh, of how this organization has shifted uh, amidst the Ukraine war um, uh, and how it shifted over time. So I want to thank everybody for your, for your, your time and wish everybody a very good day. Thank you very much.